So, the world record. World record. Let's dive straight into okay. the topic get of, into it. of the day. Because this is something that fascinates me. Yeah. Uh, just big fish in general, I think, mm-hmm. fascinate me. But since I've known you, yeah, you have told me, I mean, basically, the first day that you came to work, you told me you quit. And you're moving to Japan. <laughs> and, and you're going to go catch the world record. Yeah. So this is this is unusual behavior for Most me people. to hang around, uh, but <laughs> it's something that completely fascinates you. Mm. It's a really fun topic because uh, we've we've discussed this topic with so many different, even Japanese anglers yeah. now. Uh, you know, old school California guys. Yep. You know that that lived through a lot of the heyday, right? So, you know, big fish in general. I think are completely different. Mm-hmm. So let's let's deep dive down this rabbit hole because it feels like every time we have a conversation, it's it's sooner or later it comes up in conversation. Right. Always. So what is it for you uh, that's so fascinating about catching the world record? Is it well? Let me just let me just leave it open. Why the world record? Why is that your your goal? Because. Mm, I think it's possible. And I only think that it's possible right now on Lake Biwa. And so ever since, you know, the world record came out of Biwa in 2009, I've been very fascinated with Lake Biwa and Japan bass fishing. That's how I even started liking Japan bass fishing because I was like, well, they caught the world record there. Let me dive deeper in. Like there's this whole subsection of fishing that I had never known about. And it was all because of the world record, Mm -hmm. right? So in recent years, like maybe the past decade or so, I've been more and more fascinated with Lake Biwa because, I mean, you see some of these fish coming out of Lake Biwa and they're just freaks, just giant fish. They're tall, they're thick, they're short, but you get those ones that are 24, 25 inches and they're like teeners. And so, you know, for this past year, going to Biwa, you know, and talking to those guys that are fishing out there, I've noticed, like, they don't do a handful of things that some of the trophy hunters out here are doing. So, like, obviously, you know, I'm friends with Mike Gilbert. You're friends with Mike Gilbert. You know, Mike Gilbert right now, I think, is the best trophy hunter in the world where he has lived in SoCal for basically his whole life to chase after these super high pressured bass on super clear, deep water, small lakes in Southern California. And he's had great success in the ways that he's figured out how to catch them. You know, that's downsizing line, downsizing hooks, making farther casts, like just doing really amazing things. And when you talk to these Japanese guys or you even just see how they're fishing, they're not doing what he's doing. And that could also be just a language barrier. Where they might watch his video and they're like, wow, this guy's sick. He catches a giant bass. But he has a lot of breakdowns on like, hey, this is what I'm doing. And it's just him talking deeply about bass fishing. So that language language barrier might hurt that the Japanese guys can't pick up and start using. Hmm. So then that's where I come in because I really want to move to Japan. And it's not just because I want to go fishing there, but I love Japan as a whole. It's just a bonus that I want to move to a lake that has – the possibility and chance of catching a world record bass. Sure. I mean, if Lake Biwa was full of one-pounders and a three-pounder was big, <laughs> you probably wouldn't move 5,000 miles no, away absolutely to, not. to be there. No. Yeah. So that definitely helps in the aspect of, like, well, I want to go, and I want to give it a good college try because I'm in the position to do it. I don't have anything tying me down here in America. Wife, kids, you know, house, all that whatever stuff. That would tie a normal person down. I'm still, like, fairly young, too, to be able to do it. And so I'm like, I don't know if there's that many people in my position that are able to even go and do that. To where I'm like, dude, I can spend all of my time chasing the world record bass. I'm still young. I've got so many years. I'll pray that I have so many right, years. Right? Yep. That I can dedicate myself to figuring out how to catch that world record bass. And so, you know, when like you said kind of earlier... We've talked to a lot of the Japanese guys that have come into the shop or when we've gone over there. We've always asked them, like, you know, we're drinking a beer, having dinner, like, oh, you ever see the world record? And 
almost every single one of them has said, oh, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it here. And then you ask another guy, like, oh, I've, well, I've seen it over here on this side of the yep. lake. And you're like, oh, there's multiple world record class fish in this lake. And yeah. guys will actually put eyes on them. Yeah. Where, yeah, there's still world record bass probably in SoCal and NorCal and Texas. But to get your eyes on it is kind of rare mm. these days. But, you know, just this past trip, I was talking to uh, the guy from Signal, Okuda Manabu, and I asked him the same question, like, hey, have you seen a you know, world record recently? He's like, yeah, I saw one, I think it was last year, on a bed. And I was like, crap. And then I talked to Tomoe Shirakawa of DRT, and I asked him, have you seen the world record? He's like, oh, yeah, I've seen multiple of them. And I'm like, ugh, they're in this lake, and they're they're seen. So there's some type of confirmation of, like, I'm fishing the right area to catch this fish. But I just don't know if they're going above and beyond to truly or even have the time to go above and beyond because this would be a like a grind, a massive grind. You spend so much time trying to like figure out basically the smartest fish in the whole lake. Mm. And it's a massive lake. And Biwa, luckily enough, is a giant lake. It's huge. And yeah, there's a lot of pressure on it, but I'd rather have a giant lake than something like in SoCal that's like 40 acres. Dude, when you start thinking of some of the lakes that have kicked out giants, like if you think of a lake like Dixon, yes. for instance, right? Yeah. It's such a small lake. So tiny. That the, I mean, dude, I, I know there's 20 pounder oh, in easily. there probably. Easily. I don't know that anybody's ever going to catch it. I don't I think mean, so. you would have to be the luckiest <laughs> dude ever At this like point. i just think th it's so small mm -hmm. it's so pressured yeah. that it doesn't give the fish a chance to ever really be in a natural environment mm -hmm. and yeah. i think that's the thing that a big body of water does mm -hmm. is yeah. it lets it lets the apex predator yeah, yeah. be itself mm -hmm. without the pressure of humans Altering it. Right. Right? Yep. And and I think this is always the fun part of, of the combo mm -hmm. is, you know, you're, you're focused on, on the world record. Mm -hmm. On a lake like Biwa, that would be the biggest fish in the lake. Right. You could have a lot of this same focus in these same conversations. Mm-hmm on different levels and different scales oh, yeah. about the biggest fish in your lake. Oh, yeah, so, you absolutely. know, we're we're talking about we're talking about a freak. Yeah. Right, we're talking about a fish that that <laughs> nobody's going to ever touch except right. for you. Yeah. Right? I I got I have confidence yeah. in you, right? <laughs> but you know, if you're talking about most bodies of water, the biggest fish in the lake may be, you know, 13 pounds or 15 mm -hmm. pounds, 18 right. pounds, yep. right? Maybe, depending on where you live, maybe seven pounds right. or nine pounds, mm -hmm. right? The biggest fish is a smart, is a smart sucker. Very smart fish. Right? And I think as you get to the point of being in that high teen, low 20, mm -hmm. it's even taken to a whole other level because right. of just the length of life. Yeah. And the forage based on how oh, yes. they're going to live, right? right? Yeah. So, you know, one of the fun things about chasing in my head, like I'm envisioning you chasing this fish, is, you know, all the fish that you're going to catch in between, in between right? what <laughs> you would consider, you know, big right. to freak show. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Dude, you catch a you catch a nineteen pounder. Oh, like I think Kenta yeah. a couple years ago caught like a seventeen, 17 or an 18, eighteen or something like that, yeah, right? His yep. and, it's, and dude, I look at that fish. I'm like, bro, this is just this is a freak show. Just a monster, right? So you know, now we're talking about that plus More? a whole other five pounder added to it. Like just unbelievable stuff. So who knows what you can catch through the process? Right. Yep. Between, like I I would, I, I mean. What do you consider big on a lake like that? I mean, if twenty, if twenty-two pounds or twenty-three pounds is is the biggest fish in the lake, do you consider a ten-pounder big? I mean, I'd still like if I caught a ten on B, I'd be like, that's a big bass. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, once you get into teener, 
that's when you normally would say it saying like that's a giant bass yeah. it's a teener class fish 13 yeah. 14 15 and then beyond that I, I don't know it's an unknown level for me right I mean, you know, for most people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, the difference in in fish when you, you know, we catch here in Arizona, mm-hmm. we see a lot of seven and nine pounders. A lot of them. I mean, they're they're yeah. they're plentiful. Not that they're everywhere, <laughs> but we see we see a lot of them. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times you get a hold of an eight or a nine pounder and it's it's so much bigger than the pound and a halfers you've been catching, <laughs> yeah. right? Or that you've been seeing guys right. catch, and then yeah. you put a nine pounder, and it's like, oh my god, it's got to be ten. Yeah. And then you you weigh it, and it's nine, and and it's almost disappointing, mm-hmm. right? But then when you actually catch a ten, mm-hmm. you go, oh shit, yeah, that's a totally different fish. Oh yeah, like the difference between a nine pounder and a ten pounder mm-hmm. is is like the it's difference just, between we, a, a, a like a a flyweight boxer and a, and a heavyweight boxer. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, and when you see him, it's like, oh, that's different. Just a different class. And it's the same, like, when you go from 10, 11 to 13, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's the same. Oh, it's like so, you yeah. get a 13, it's like, oh, dude, that's totally different. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is a whole other class, right? <laughs> yeah. I would imagine the same would be said for each one of these levels. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So what, what do you think each one of these levels – how does it? How do you think it changes, right? So I mean, the difference between catching a five pounder and a ten pounder, you you can get lucky. I mean, guys get lucky hmm. out here, right? right? Like there was a, somebody in the store the other day that caught a ten pounder on, on a sleeper crawl, threw it up on the on the shore, <laughs> you know, made a bad cast, <laughs> pulled it out of the tree, and yeah. it landed like in a foot of water, and his line started swimming off, and yeah. it was a ten pounder. Like crazy. This is the kind of luck I need every once right. in a while. That yeah, I, never get, I think everybody right? wants that kind of luck. Right. So I mean, crazy shit can happen. Yeah. But catching ten pounders consistently consistently is not an easy no. feat. Even even eight nine pounders not an easy feat right. right that's a that's a totally different fish mm-hmm. but when you start talking about fish that are creeping into the teens and then even upper teens and 20s what what changes in those fish what what do you think why do you think they become so hard is it because they're few and far between like there's less population of them or do you think the fish changes and gets wise and gets smart and changes the behavior. I definitely believe that there's definitely levels with in behavior with fish from, you know, five to eight pounds, eight pounds, and like eights and nines will kind of do the same thing. But then it's so hard to catch that 10 here. Like you were saying, there's tons of those seven to nines. And we catch a ton of those seven to nines. But why is it so much harder to catch one that's just a pound bigger Mm. like what is that Mm. and i know that there's tons of them right but it almost just feels like at certain levels the fish start thinking differently about where they feed and how they feed to better their chances so maybe in those windows where the seven and nines are feeding the 10 doesn't want to or 10 pluses don't want to compete with the seven and nines they're like i will just wait when you guys get your fail and we'll roll up at different times. And I would assume it, it goes on like that where the bigger the fish, I would assume they're going to get much lazier and they want as easy as of a meal as possible. So I would assume that they will just think differently about when they want to move up, when they feed. And I think it's that changes where you're kind of content with catching those seven to nines that you don't think differently because mm. why would you leave what you know and it, what's working? Right. Because it's kind of scary because it's like, well, I don't want to leave this guarantee thing to go. Well, it's kind of like the old skunk. saying, right? You don't leave fish to find fish. Right. Exactly. So, and I feel like a lot of people will get into that, but you know, conversations that I've had with, you know, my buddies and obviously like Mike Gilbert, it's like, if you want to get into that upper echelon of fish, what do you need to change that will match those fish. And sometimes it is just like fishing those same spots, but just at different times, better times. And what I found, even with my first double digit, I'd been catching a lot of those seven and nines, and I was fishing like okay times, where I'm like, I should get bit, 
but it's not the best time. Like times when I'm like, I should probably catch a giant. It it was more like, yeah, this is like a good time, but this is a, this one thing or this second thing is off. But that's fine. I can still catch a fish. But the day I caught my ten, almost every check was like checked off. Mm. Where it was like, oh wow, three days after a trout stocking, three days before a new moon, perfect weather. There was nobody out there. I made the right cast, the right speed, the right lure. I didn't hang up the bait. Like everything checked. Yep. And it just made sense in my mind of like, all right, that fish was there that day because the conditions were so perfect. And I don't know what kind of conditions would make a 17 plus 18, 19, a world record bass bite. Hmm. But that's the journey of it. Right. Right. And that, so to work your way, you have to start like, all right, so this is how I catch the tens. This is how I catch the teeners. Then you try and figure out like, well, a 20 is probably going to do something different than a, like a 12, but will it do something similar to like a 17 or 18? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Right. Maybe they school together. Right. Right. And so then you'd have to figure out like, all right, how am I going to get that fish to bite? Which obviously is who knows what the fuck that is. Right. Right. But it's just that journey. And it's just what that takes is just so much time on the water. It, well, there's right. no there's no substitute there's no for substitute. that, right? Because there's not there's been so few mm -hmm. giants right caught mm -hmm. that there's not really like a playbook to it, <laughs> right? So I mean, we could sit in a store like this and and share experiences mm -hmm. and teach people how to go catch fish and yep. have a good time. Yep. And. I should really quick maybe just put a little asterisk to mm. what we're talking about. You know, we're we're obviously talking about this freak of nature and trying to figure out how do we how do we connect with a right. twenty three pound yeah. bass, right? Yep. But all these conversations that we're having can also be applied no matter where somebody is fishing. Absolutely. You know, we're talking about trophy size fish, mm -hmm. but the same conversations we're having like for instance what you were saying about you know you catch seven pounders on a spot well maybe a 10 pounder uses the same spot mm -hmm. but just at a better time yeah these same things can be applied to any fishing that anybody listening is doing absolutely you know we apply the same things even urbanly yes. like you know i think about the biggest fish that i've caught in like small ponds it's always in the best high percentage spot mm -hmm. when like you show up and it's like oh bro this is the day like the water's right yep. the moon's right the timing's right nobody's been messing with the spot mm -hmm. it's like ah, if a big one is going to use that spot this is the time this right? Is the time right so you know these same things like a tournament guy could use this info and if you're if you're pre-fishing you're catching two pounders or you're you're fishing you're like oh there's a lot of life in this area mm -hmm really narrowing it down to that key specific area yeah. and figuring out what that key spot within the spot is mm. and then being there at the exact right moment and and then again not fucking it up yeah. right like sometimes you gotta make sorry. the right cast you yep. gotta have the right bait you gotta not snag you gotta do all yeah. these things to not blow mm. the spot right? right but all this information can be applied mm -hmm. to to all sorts of fishing not Absolutely. specifically trophy right. fishing yeah but by the time you get to be a high teen fish, mm -hmm. a twenty pound fish, right? You've you've seen some shit. A lot of stuff. Like man. you've lived a lot of life in that body of water. Yeah. Not just not just in in nature mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, what food is good to eat, easy to eat, fun to eat, fulfilling, mm -hmm. what's a waste of time. Like you've spent your whole life learning all these things, yeah. right? But then the amount of fake shit that you've seen, yeah. if you've made it to be 20 pounds, it's probably pretty likely you've been caught probably. a handful of times at least mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah. Maybe at different stages. Maybe you're caught at one pound, four pounds, eight pounds, yep. 12 pounds. Like, so you have learning that you've learned. Yes. Uh, it's fascinating to hear 
like scientists like study oh, yeah. this stuff and that talk stuff. about how DNA passes <laughs> that stuff's a trip down. It's it's crazy. It's like crazy. we think of DNA on a human level mm-hmm. as like what color my eyes are gonna be and <laughs> you know, is is my nose gonna be big or like my hair gonna be blonde yeah. or like am I gonna be tall? Like this is like the stuff that we think of. Yeah. And certainly this exists in bass mm-hmm. as well. Like if there's a reason why Texas only takes these giant bass and spawns them because the DNA is a proven DNA, Mm -hmm. right? But fish have this ability to pass down learned experiences to their offspring, which is Mm mind-blowing that that could be. Wouldn't that, dude, I would have killed for that. You know how much extra fishing time I could have had? My kids could have just learned all the shit. Right. I had yeah. to fucking. I wish they already knew that yeah. skill. Yeah, right. Oh, cool. They know all that shit. Cool. I'm going to go fishing. But I guess for them, it's an instinct. Mm. Because for them, when we catch them, I had this revelation. I guess not really real revelation, but I brought this point up to my buddy. I was like, yeah, when you hook a bass, that thing's not fighting for fun. It's fighting because it thinks it's going to die. Mm. And it's, it's like, dude, I'm going to die if I can't get away from whatever's got me, right? And so that is very traumatizing, right? And so just like how, you know, other animals in the animal kingdom, just from birth, they will have instincts of, like, what danger is, what's good, what's bad. And so, like, bass have the same thing. I mean, when you see an eagle or bird fly over and there's a bass shallow, that thing takes off because it knows, like, that thing – don't really know what it is, but it, it might get me. It might kill me, right? So they know, like, that thing flying, that shadow, that's no good. And I would assume humans will become, if not already, something very similar to that. Whether th- it's just how we stand, how we look. It's like that two-legged thing is not good. The way that it's standing up is kind of like a bird, right? Mm. And so those genes that are passing down, they just turn into instincts for the fish. And that's why a lot of people will say, why was, you know, the fishing so good in Southern California in like the 90s and early 2000s? Well, a lot of those fish were just getting kept. So they couldn't pass down the genes Mm. of like, these are bad, you know, beans or whatever. So fish were growing, guys were catching them, and they were hanging them on the wall. Yes. This is during the the most epic Mm -hmm. taxidermy days where if you caught caught a fish (laughs) over eight pounds, you hung that bitch on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, 45-pound stringers, 50-pound stringers were getting taken home and yeah. out of the lakes. Yeah. And so those genes weren't being passed down. Mm. So they kept catching big ones. But now that, you know, bass fishing at as a whole is always about catch and release, oh, we just make them smarter, yeah. making them harder. Because mm. especially I feel like the bigger fish will be more traumatized by the whole thing because they have to go through the process of, like, well, I just got caught because with the small ones, you catch them, you throw them, shake them off, you throw them back. Right. The big ones, it's a whole thing. It's screaming. It's yelling. You're grabbing the fish over. You're throwing in the well. You're dry. Like crazy things. And then in Texas, they will just take them, take them to a whole different place, yep. have a male spawn, whatever. Then you get taken back. Like I feel like the whole process is very traumatizing for the fish. Mm. And I feel like they truly remember that. So then I'm like, well, that offspring that they just had, aren't they going to know about this? So it's like almost detrimental in a way that it could just make the fishing harder right? to catch giant bass in the future. Right. And it's been like this whole thing of like, I wonder if, you know, the effect of Biwa and our lakes even out here is maybe having less bass will grow fish. And I feel like we've talked about this with back rack as well, mm-hmm. where everybody's like, oh, this probably – a world record and back rack and i feel like you don't believe that i think it's some some point so i i was pretty fortunate mm-hmm. back you know six seven years ago that i spent like three solid years <laughs> like every three weeks like a week a month that's crazy right yeah so you know and this was during the time when nobody was going down there mm-hmm. because everybody was terrified of <laughs> getting their head chopped off rightfully right so. and yeah get, rightfully <laughs> so but uh you know so i basically had the whole place to myself for mm-hmm. like the first year and a half um i think i think there are certain things that need to happen i, I would i would argue that backrack's probably the greatest 
quote unquote big fish factory that the world has seen so mm-hmm. far. If mm-hmm. if we're if we're considering ten pounders a big one, yes, right. Mm-hmm. But even at a place like Backrack, the amount of seven and nine pounders is staggering. Like mm-hmm. there's a huge difference between a nine pounder and a ten pounder, mm-hmm. and then again, a huge difference between a ten and a thirteen. Right. Right. Most people are satisfied with those seven and nine pounders. Right. Right. Yeah. So most most people that bass fish mm-hmm. don't catch eight pounders. Yeah. Like that's, that's true. just not a thing. It's not like a thing. most people, if they catch their first five pounder, they think it's a ten because right. they've never seen a fish that <laughs> looks like that. Right. Because the whole body changes. Mm-hmm. And then you get to an eight pounder and it's changed again. Mm-hmm. So, you know, most people are super content if you pull up on a school of eight and nine pounders, oh, dude, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it got to the point, you know, the last year, um, I think it was 2019, where, remember Instagram did this thing where it was like top nine of your <laughs> yeah. year, and you made the little grid, yeah. right? And I remember that was the last time that I, I really, like, posted from down there. Um, but it took almost a 14-pounder to make my top nine. Wow. Like, it was just fucking stupid. Yeah. Like, hundreds of 10-pounders in a year, right? That's insane. But I don't think the lake is capable. Mm. I I think there's a cap on it. I'm not saying that there's not a world record mm-hmm. down there. But I feel like for there to truly be a world record fish, I feel like it needs to live mm. in an environment that's conducive for it to get to that size. Mm. And I feel like Backrack is such a volatile up and down mm. water fishery. Mm-hmm. I think it's just a magical place to grow 10, 11 pounders. Oh, really? I, I, yeah, because there's tilapia everywhere. Yeah. Yep. There's shad everywhere. Tons of fish. It's the right, I mean, it's it's tropical. Mm-hmm. So the weather's good. It's yeah. warm. The food's there. It's relatively light fishing. I mean, granted, there's literally a maze of gill nets every day. You've got to <laughs> swim around and not die. Yeah. Right? But for the most part, it's it's literally just a, a perfect factory mm. to make these beautiful, you know, 8 to 12 pound fish. Mm-hmm. But I feel like to get to that next level, mm. I feel like you, I feel like that big fish is a, probably a homebody. Mm. I don't think a I don't think a twenty pounder is a roamer. No, I, I don't think a twenty imagine. pounder is just cruising around <laughs> looking for new places to yeah. live. Like it's cool by this rock, and oh shit, the lake just fell twenty feet. Let me go swim a hundred yards and find another home. Right. Like I just don't yeah. think that's the way. I, f- I mean, so. if you think of humans, right? The only way you could get to six hundred pounds <laughs> is you kind of gotta just. <laughs> Go from your couch to your bed, or maybe never leave the couch. Ca- like right. you can't be active, no, and get to six hundred pounds. No, like it's just not possible. Doesn't work. So a twenty pounder has got to be just a fat freak. Mm-hmm. Like I think to a certain extent, maybe lazy. Yeah. Like you know, uh, you think of like a a full grown like lion or tiger, like just this like yeah brute muscular <laughs> like yep. just gonna go chase down that fucking gazelle yeah. and like i don't think that's a 20 pounder no. I, and now granted never seen one <laughs> right so right. this is all just completely theory right but i almost feel like once that fish kind of passes that low to mid teen mm-hmm. i almost feel like the fish just gets smart and lazy and knows that if it's patient Something the, the right on. thing is going to come along right right yeah. because they've they've found the right house mm-hmm. yeah their house is cool and maybe their house is you know 20 yards or yeah. 30 yards yeah. or whatever but i don't think i don't i can't imagine that a 20 pounder rolling cruises like a, a two mile span no. of area like it just doesn't make any sense like they sense. would burn too many calories bass mm-hmm. just aren't built that way right so I I I think I think you need a lake that's stable, mm-hmm. right? So you need a place like Biwa yeah. or, you know, I fuck I could see a lake like Clear Lake having it too if it didn't oh, wow. have so much pressure. 
Mm. I just think it's got too much pressure now. Oh, really? And I don't know that it has the right DNA. So mm. I, I think Texas, maybe, Absolutely. could kick yeah. something out. Um, but I think where BYU is special is that the forage is so diverse. Yes. Like when you think of our U.S. lakes, like even when you think of Bacharach, dude, it's shad and tilapia. Yeah. They didn't even have a fucking crawdad. No. Right? So <laughs> shad and tilapia, that's yep. it. When you think of, you know, California, you start getting a little more diverse, and that's why we saw so many giants for so yeah. long because you had all those trout stockings yep. and those trout eaters, right? Mm -hmm. When you think of Texas, you're kind of back to tilapia and bluegills and, gizzard you know, gizzard shad. Yeah. When you think of Biwa and you've got just, I mean, a never-ending supply oh, really dude. of food. The list you know, You've got on all the on. bluegills. Mm -hmm. You've got, you don't have shad, but you have wakasagi. Wakasagi. Then you have oh, yeah. ayu that's kind of like a trout. Yeah. You have hasu. hasu. It's yeah. kind of like a trout mm -hmm. or like a carp. You have yeah. harabuna that's a Harabuna. carp. Nigoi. You, like, yeah. The list plus, goes on. Plus the all. trout. Yeah. Plus, plus the, the Biwa masu. Yep. So you've got the trout. And they they can they can find an area where food comes and goes yeah. and they have protection and as long as they avoid all the dangers mm -hmm. that you're referencing, yeah. right? That whether it's passed down or mm -hmm. learned. Yeah. I mean I don't know how many times I've caught a giant fish or even the same fish from mm. the same place. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and I know that you have similar, you know, maybe not the same fish from places, but, you know, you go to a, a target-rich environment here locally, mm -hmm. you have a milk run of spots. Yeah. Because no matter how big a lake is, there's only so many spots that literally set up well. for a big one to not just live, mm -hmm. because finding a fish that lives there is great. Yeah. But you got to find not only where it <laughs> lives, but you got to figure out, Where's the dinner table? Like, okay, right. here's the house. Mm -hmm. Where the hell is he eating? Right. And how do I put my fake ass food <laughs> in, right. to him in a way to where he's going to reach it. out and get it? Yeah. Right. So, so many things have to happen. Right. Right. But yeah, I I feel like I feel like it's everything kind of similar to what you said. Like to catch a big one, mm -hmm. everything has to line up. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like everything has to line up for a place to produce a big one. Yes place is huge right? yeah what do you think about what do you think about sonar sonar mm -hmm. uh i think sonar is a, an amazing tool absolutely fantastic tool but i do think it gets used a little too much but what do you think about sonar in terms of giants do you think do you think they're wise to it mm-hmm do you think it bothers them? Do you think it? They're so used to it that it's just another day in paradise with the ting 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 things going on in their so. Head? I think it obviously uh, depends on where you're fishing. But if you're fishing a very pressured body of water, and I'll just use forward-facing sonar because it's the thing right now. When you're fishing a body of water that has a lot of boats on it, and ninety percent of the boats are using forward-facing graphs. I mean, you're beaming every fish in the lake, right? And I think the giant bass, at first, they don't know what it is. They're just getting hit with it, and they're like, I don't know what that is. Oh, shit, there's a lure. And then they, or a real fish or whatever, and they eat it, right? But I think after some time of feeling that beam all the time and started associating with, ah, that beam's like no good, I think the big ones will catch on to it much faster. Mm -hmm. And... I've talked to buddies that I've asked them, I'm like, hey, have you felt that the fish have already, like, started to come be more weary about forward facing? And everybody has said yes. And so, and that, I talked to Tamori Shirakawa. I asked him the same question, like, hey, do you feel like the Beaver fish are starting to feel this? And he's like, yes. I've talked to Mike Gilbert. I'm like, how do you feel about your fish? He's like, absolutely. So it seems to be a trend where the forward facing right now, it, it, in somebody's water, it still works, but I think it's starting to lose its magic. Mm. And so, a great example is if you're in your house and you're just chilling, you're vibing, whatever, and you start hearing just like a weird, just clicking noise or just something off, you know it. You might let it go by for a while, but if you keep hearing it and you're like, 
what the hell is that? I've got to go see it what that is. It puts you on edge somehow. Yeah, something's yeah, off. Yeah. And yeah. then and then you're like, well, i got to go figure out what the hell this thing is. And then you find, or maybe you don't find it, and you're like, now I can't get it out of my head. Mm. Now it's becoming annoying, mm. and I want to get rid of this thing, or I've got to move to a different part of the house that doesn't have, like, as humans, we have that same thing. And so I would assume that the fish that want to stay safe and be secure will finally associate with that pinging, whatever it is, as something bad. Yeah. And so if everybody's doing it, then eventually the fish are just going to feel it every day, and that gets old fast. Yeah. And obviously us as humans, we don't know the effects of these beams that these graphs and sonars are, are doing to the fish, but sound in the water is amplified. So that ticking that you hear from your graph or from forward facing, like you can hear it when you put your ear next to it. You just know like uh, it's probably like five times louder underwater, mm. right? And so the fish are going to hear that. Sure. And then they're also going to feel it too. And then if they follow your thing to the boat and they see it's a boat, they know like, ah, it's those darn human things. Yep. I got to stay away from that. Yeah. And so, you know, there's definitely times when uh, my buddy will be like, I'll drop the trolling motor, I'll scope them, and I'll hit a fish, and that fish just bolts the other way. And that fish is fucking like 100 feet away. And I'm like, well, he didn't bolt from me. He bolted from that beam hitting him, yep. and he went this way. And then he'll find that fish again, hit it again, fish goes the other way. Yep. And I'm like, dude, that's insane. And life well, scope hasn't been around for that long. A lot of this is learned behavior too. So a mm. lot of these fish are, you know, with, with you know, talking about forward faces sonar, a lot of these fish are being caught in places that they had not really Never. been caught before. Yes. The right so suspended. Yeah. Out in the middle Chilling, of nowhere. You know, used to just being left alone and <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden we're sticking hooks in them. Mm -hmm. And you know, to get back to your point of like learned behavior, a fish is gonna associate certain things with danger. Yes. So, you know, maybe you caught it on a jerk bait mm -hmm. and so he's gonna associate jerk baits with danger, but he's also associating that you know that pinging sound that mm -hmm. click, click 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 that yeah. crazy sound so he hears it again and instantly he's thinking danger danger right he yeah. hears it the next day oh danger same yep. thing mm -hmm. i'll never forget the first time that i jumped over the side of my boat to swim like on a hot summer day oh, okay yeah and just screwing around mm -hmm. how loud mm. the graphs actually are underwater, underwater right? to our ears and yeah. we're, we're, our ears aren't even meant to hear underwater <laughs> yeah and so, I mean, if anybody's listening and they've never actually done that, Try you it. should turn your graphs on mm. and put your head underwater, right? I mean, not for longer <laughs> than like 20 seconds, but uh, you should you should listen to it. Mm -hmm. CJ and Julius, I think, went and shot a video mm. on the Colorado River earlier this year, and you saw a smallmouth like on a bed. And so CJ dropped a GoPro down, just like, hey, let's just make a cool little yeah. shot and see if we can catch this smallie off the bed. Mm -hmm. And they did. But Julius had all his graphs on, including his forward-facing sonar. Bro, I don't know if you ever heard this video. It is so loud. No. Like, it is insanely no is loud, it? that forward-facing sonar. <laughs> CJ, if you find that clip... Put it in here no so way. that people can hear how loud that actually yeah. is. Yeah. Wow. The craziest part about that yeah. is his sonar wasn't even pointed at the fish. We were just oh, wow. over the bed. The front of the boat was angled out towards the main river. Yeah. So it was just like residual sound of the sonar. Wow. Yeah. It was insane. Crazy. I got to think, dude, mm -hmm. that if you're, if you're a big fish, mm -hmm. you are only going to feel comfortable in your complete 100% natural environment. Absolutely. I remember, you know, back when I was just getting into swim baits mm -hmm. and really like tournament fishing and stuff and trying to catch giants was like my favorite thing to yeah. do. Dude, all grass would be off. Mm -hmm. Like even at night, we'd fish at night a lot. Oh, yeah. Never a light. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, it became this trend to get all these LED lights mm. for night fishing and like LED black lights and LED this. <laughs> and the next thing you know, these fuckers are lighting up the whole fucking bank and you could see light underneath their boat like 15 feet down. It's like, 
are you guys fucking stupid? Like, what do you think the fish are going to do? Yeah. They're going to swim the fuck away. I don't, <laughs> they're going to, it's like if an alien started like shooting a, right, a scope a, down a beam on or... you, it's like, are you just going to stand there and be like, oh, whoa, what's That's this so fucking cool. <laughs> beam? No, I'm going to run the fuck away. Right. So I think all these like little things mm-hmm. that probably aren't a big deal for just like day in and day out normal right. fishing. Yeah have to be considered mm-hmm. when we're talking about what should in theory be the smartest mm-hmm. fish yeah. in the lake. Mm-hmm. They have to take all this into consideration. They have to. Yeah. And obviously like let's take Biwa for instance. So on Lake Biwa, the northern part of Lake Biwa is pretty gin clear. We're talking twenty foot visibility, twenty five foot visibility. And when you have these bass and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, you always hear like, dude, that's a bug-eyed freak. Oh, you're saying that their eyes got bigger, so they might be able to see better? Mm. Oh. So then, in that super gin clear water, that, you know, teener class fish or world record class fish, its eyesight's pretty good in that gin clear water. So what can it do with that? Well, it can swim up to your bait and, like, side-eye it. And even out here, I've seen fish do that, where they'll swim side to side with your bait and, mm-hmm. like, look it up and down. Yep. And you're like, oh, God, it's learning. Eat it. Just eat it. Yep. Like, And so you would think, like, well, the world record will probably do the same thing on a lure, where it just swims up to it, looks at it, and there might be some signal where it's like, mm, nope, something's wrong with that. Yep. And then they don't eat it, right? Well, let's talk about that real mm. quick. Not to interrupt, yeah. but that signal. Uh-huh. It could literally be anything. It could be anything, dude. It could be the sound of your line cutting through the cutting water, through the water, the hook rubbing Dangling. on the bait, yep. the, even just the hook swinging. They're yep. like, "What the fuck is that mm-hmm. thing?" Like, the these are fish that have the ability to completely dissect mm-hmm. the bullshit that we're trying to <laughs> feed them. <laughs> right? These aren't some stupid two pounders. They're no. like, "Oh, cool food." Yeah. Like, no. No. This they is, eat the real thing yes. so often. Yep. And they know what it is. They they see how it swims, natural. Mm-hmm. And then this super weird thing comes rolling through. Like, they're going to come look at it and be like, this doesn't look like what I normally eat. Like, <laughs> one of my favorite things is, like, you look at a spinnerbait, right? And you're like, spinnerbait does not look like just a normal shad, right? right. Or, or a hasu or anything like that. Nope. And fish will eat it. But... When you think about when you hold the spinnerbait next to like a live bluegill, or whatever, and you're like, <laughs> doesn't really look like it, you know what I mean? And obviously, color is there, but just swim or movement and how it moves naturally, how it can go this way or that way, you're like a big fish will know what the real thing is. The only time that a big fish will slip up is just one of those off chances, those odd days. You know, you can be perfect at something, but if you do it so often, eventually you you mess up. There's plenty of times when I've done something where I've done it a thousand times, and I mess it up one day. I'm like, wow, I I completely screwed that up. Absolutely. That's just what you're hoping to get with the world record fish or just a giant fish in general is that day that it might know your thing is fake, but it might be like, ah, I gotta, I gotta test it. I gotta try it. Yeah. Or it's like in a mood where it's like, I just scarf down three whatever. I'm juiced right now. This thing is swimming by. It looks kind of funny, but it's right there. So I'm just gonna bite it. Or you caught it in a time where maybe it just turns its head and and your your bait just happens to be there and it eats it and it, for whatever reason didn't it know didn't. It. Yeah. It didn't dissect it. It mm-hmm. didn't think it through. It yep. just. It had that instinct, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it just reacted to it, yeah. Right, like you could have been going through a rock with a deep crank, yeah. A lure that we think catches giants, yes. and has the possibility of catching world record bass. Yes. The crankbait could be going, and it's just doing its normal thing, and then the fish could be following it, and then it bounces off a rock, like a random rock. It bounces, and that fish is like, oh, and then bites it, and then you got your fish, hmm. right? So it could be something as simple as that, where you, you were just going, and it was. It was following it, but just something made it react, and it got it to bite. Now, I don't – I'm not a huge, like, deep crankbait uh, connoisseur. I know, you know, some of your biggest fish that you've caught have been on a deep crank. Mm -hmm. For me, I've always just been, like, 
I've always tried to target the fish that don't react, but just think it's real in mm. some way, shape, or form. So they just eat it, I think, better. And so that what's fascinating is I, I would like to learn more about like how you've caught them on a deep crank, especially just big ones, because it's always fascinating to me on how like something that fast moving gets them to eat. Because when I always think about giant bass, I think they're lazy, and they just want to kind of come up to something and they just... And then go back down. But you're, you know, working a crankbait. Yeah, but I still think it's lazy. Hmm. So I don't, I, I'm curious mm -hmm. when a fish gets to 20 pounds, mm -hmm. if it, if it's going to eat out of reaction mm. or if it's going to eat purely out of thoughtful feeding, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, it's, it's dissected it and it knows it's real. Right. Right. Yeah. I think with the deep crank, one of the reasons why it's so effective mm -hmm. for big ones mm. is that I I would imagine the majority of giant fish mm. probably live on the bottom. Oh, really? Okay. I I think they're either on the bottom or they're suspended somewhere that's just like perfectly easy mm -hmm. for them to just sink down two feet and be completely covered by like on the uh, top of a big tree oh, yeah right like mm -hmm. if you've got big cottonwoods in a creek channel like yeah. i could see a giant like chilling at the top of those trees because mm -hmm. in two <laughs> flicks of their tail they're down in the tree and yeah. safe maybe on a, a big steep wall where mm -hmm. it's sitting on a ledge maybe it's just suspended off that in the darkness and in mm -hmm. two kicks of the tail it can be in 60 feet or it could be in six feet right yeah, yeah. i think a, i think a deep crank is one of those baits where if you are good at your angles mm. so this is the same kind of stuff that you do with your with your glides or with your soft baits right yeah. it's all about angles yes. you can't just start <laughs> heaving this fucking thing in the middle of the water and just assume that a fucking 15 pounder is going to come over and eat it yep i think you have to know how they sit up where they're positioned what they're ambushing mm. on mm -hmm. right and present the angle correctly yeah and it's kind of like if you put the angle correctly and the fish was in the right spot and the bait was in the right spot, mm -hmm. the fish has two choices. It can either move its tail and get out of the way yeah, or it eats it. It eats it, yeah. And I think it's probably more often than not mm -hmm. it moves out of the way. Yeah. But on those times when it doesn't want to move out of the way, it eats it. Yeah. Then, boom, you're, you got you're in. Yeah. So I don't know that ever mm. a a smart teen <laughs> fish is hearing this crankbait grinding <laughs> from 100 feet away saying oh fuck yeah here comes my food like this is what i'm used to right i'm gonna wait i'm gonna wait i'm gonna wait it's yeah. coming 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 coming, coming. Oh, there it is. <laughs> like i don't think that's ever going through its mind right right yeah i think it's probably thinking what the fuck is that sound yeah like, why is this thing grinding and getting louder and getting closer and mm -hmm. i can hear it coming and it's moving it's ah oh, shit it's right there and they just yeah they eat it mm -hmm. like i don't think it's ever like a feeding thing right unless it's a suspended fish uh, suspended yeah. fish are are different right like Very. so i could see if they're suspended under bait on top of trees or whatever mm -hmm. then then possibly you could be catching them off uh, off of a bite mm. right where you're t ticking treetops or you're putting it just in their zone yeah but yeah. most of the big ones that i've caught on a deep crank have been grinding got it not really suspended yeah. right i know back in the day there were guys out here that used to troll you know with downriggers and deep mm -hmm. cranks and wow they would try to pick off those suspended fish in 60, 70, 80 feet, and they'd catch giants. Oh, you know, really? they'd, they'd suspend it or white bass or stripers oh, or makes sense. Yeah. crappie. You know, I'm yeah. sure they do the same thing on trout and yeah. different, you know, you know, salmon and mm -hmm. Northern California and stuff. But I think it's a reaction thing. Mm. And I think it's just if your angle's right, you you just haven't given them – well, you've, you've reduced the options. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think when you're talking with a super smart fish, the less options you give them, the better. Absolutely. And I think that's why something like a deep crank has a higher percentage of catching a giant mm -hmm. than, say, something like a, a worm. Mm. You know, not that you can't catch a giant on right. a worm. Right. But you now you've given them a whole other option mm. of, yeah, they can kick their tail and get away from it. Yes, they can put it in their mouth so they have the same two options. 
or they can just watch it. <laughs> yeah, go scoot by. on by. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? You've yeah. given them a whole third option. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I just I don't think it's playing to any of their. I don't think a big fish wants to be instinctive. Hmm. Like, I don't think it wants to. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think it wants to be reactive. Oh, okay. I think it wants to be. Like, I think it wants to think about it. Okay. Yeah. Like that what makes you're sense. saying. Yeah. Use its big eyes to study it. Make sure it knows. Mm-hmm. Like, you got to think that by the time a fish gets to the high teens, how many, how many, like, trout or hasu or bluegills, mm-hmm. how many, how many have, has it eaten, God. do you think, in its lifetime? Thousands, probably. Thousands, right? You know what I mean? But so it knows. It knows. The sound, the feel, mm-hmm. the lateral line. Like, it knows exactly what that should be. Right. In a natural it way. It knows. Yeah. Because it's done it thousands <laughs> of times. Right. So it's just like what we, you know, we humans. I don't know why I say it that way. But it's just like what we humans say about, like, trying to become an expert. Mm. Of You know, you do something 10,000 times before you can call yourself an expert. Yeah. The more you do something, you do it thousands of times, just the more instinctive it is. Yeah, the, the more, more you just know, like, yeah. oh, this is what it is. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So you can't tell me that all of a sudden you put some bullshit down there, <laughs> you know, whether it's a glide bait, a crankbait, a worm, or whatever, right? Yeah. And they're, they think that that shit's real. Right. Yeah. So I don't know if there's ever a way mm-hmm. without just putting a fucking treble hook in a trout's head and sending her down there. <laughs> Right, like, I don't, I, I don't know if there's a way that you can, c- you can outsmart a twenty pounder right. that your shit's real. Right, I think it has to be some kind of just reaction, mm. like what you said, where their guard was down, mm-hmm. they fucked up. Yeah, right. They they know better. Yeah, and the second they're hooked, I guarantee you, they're like, they're like fuck, fuck. God yeah, of damn it. Of course, right. this is what happened. <laughs> yeah, right. The one day. Yeah. Yeah. What I wanted to talk about real fast is that uh, you say angles. Mm-hmm. And since fishing with you uh, and watching you fish, one of the biggest things I always felt like you were very adamant about is having the right angle. Mm. And I subconsciously like knew what you were talking about, and I kind of did the same thing. But the way that you were talking about it, always saying, like, I got to get the right angle. This is the right angle. If I throw just a little this way or if I position my body this way, that's not the angle. And I watched it so many times with you where you're like, ah, this isn't the angle. I, I lost my angle. Hold on. Let me try and find it again. And then it'd take you a couple casts and you'd find it again and you'd get bit. I'm like, how is this happening? Mm. He's he's literally casting kind of in the same area, but there's literally one lane that they're eating his bait. And I was, it was just so fascinating when like I saw it in your fishing area and we weren't catching big ones, but it was just fish. I'm like, if the small ones are doing that, then the big ones probably are thinking the same exact well, thing. Well, it, it's more amplified. I guarantee, yeah, I guarantee you it's more amplified. Yeah. Mm-hmm. D- I mean, dude, you're a huge angle guy, yeah. too. Mm-hmm. I I think in all of fishing, I know that you and I argue a lot about color, <laughs> right? That you think color makes no difference, yeah. and I think it's critically important. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so we could have, this could be another topic, okay? This will be another podcast episode. But- I think of all the things that you break down, mm. like that go into a cast, that go into catching a fish. Mm-hmm. I think angle is the number one most important piece. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't know that angle makes any difference when they're just in a frenzy. Right. If they're boiling fish out in the middle <laughs> yeah, of the lake, okay. fun cares, throw out there. <laughs> yeah. Bass population is good. Go anywhere. All right. <laughs> so, but, dude, I, I think bass are just so ambush minded yes Mm -hmm. and i think that bass have i think that bass have two things similar to how we do like when you think of humans and you think of where we live Mm -hmm. we live in a house right and we don't usually eat in our bedroom no (laughs) right we usually eat in our kitchen yeah they're like two different places. Mm-hmm. Like we have our place to chill. Like we got a couch and a TV and our our, our bed. Like yeah. that's our chill area, yeah. right? And usually when we're there, right? Yeah, like eating's not really 
We're not thinking about that. Right. We're thinking about just chilling. Mm-hmm. But when we're hungry, we usually go in the kitchen yeah. and we eat, mm-hmm. right? So I think baths are very similar. I think so, too. You know, I mean, if I'm sitting in bed and a fillet gets pulled across my body two feet away from me, right. I'm going to eat the fucking thing, <laughs> right? But, like, I, I'm not usually just sitting there like, oh, man, I could sure use some spaghetti right now. Yeah. Like, if I, if I want spaghetti, I go in the kitchen and I eat it. Yeah. I think bass are the same, mm-hmm. and I think that a big fish has areas where it lives and it feels comfortable and mm-hmm. it knows its environment. Yeah. And, it, you know, you got to think that it's not like bass have any fun. It's not no. like they have hobbies, <laughs> no. right? So... <laughs> I mean, literally, their entire mission in life is don't get eaten yeah. and eat a bunch of shit. Yeah, like that's it. That's and reproduce it. Yeah. once a year yeah. if you're lucky. Yep. Like, so if it's eaten something mm-hmm. and it's full, it knows it's full. Yeah. It doesn't need to be hanging out in the kitchen. No. It's gonna go chill wherever it's chilling. Right. right? Mm-hmm. But when it's hungry, then it goes back into the it, kitchen. It's probably not gonna be eating in the place where it just hangs out to be safe. Right. Probably somewhere very close to that mm-hmm. is a is a high percentage spot for that fish where it knows like, hey, these shad move right through here, yeah. you know, twice a day, mm-hmm. or these trout move right here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yep. so when I when I think of angles, I'm always trying to think of like the feeding yes. side. Mm-hmm. Like, there's every fish at this point is is smart to a certain extent because look at all the pressure yeah like even if they're not big ones even a little one like fuck dude a normal day i mean there's got to be at least a hundred if not 200 boats on every lake around us every day yeah you take a lake like biwa i mean fuck dude you're in the thousands sometimes yeah right especially when you like south lake yeah Dude, it's amazing a bass even lives down there. <laughs> so, you know, those fish have just seen so many things mm-hmm. that if you're, it's it's just not going to give it to you. No. It, it's not going to be easy. No. Like, you have to really nail it. But I also think the angle is, is feeding to the reaction piece. Hmm. So no matter how lifelike you think you are with a crankbait or a spinnerbait, like you said, yeah. right, or a glide bait mm-hmm. or whatever it is that you're throwing, right, it's bullshit. Absolutely. It's made out of plastic and wire, and it's got fucking fluorocarbon attached to it, and you're pulling it through the wall. Like, it, <laughs> it sounds, it moves, it looks nothing like what they're exactly. actually eating. Yeah. So the likelihood that you're catching fish that are seeing your bullshit and saying, fuck yeah, there That's it is. That's a real That's thing, baby. exactly what I've been eating all day. <laughs> yeah. I got to think is as close to 0% <laughs> as you get. I think the majority of fish, I bet you 99% of the fish that we catch is just some kind of reaction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe it had the color or <laughs> the profile yeah. or the movement mm-hmm. or the depth right like these are all things that we use different lures for exactly but a fish is going to react at a certain angle much differently than a different angle. i mean dude if you're if you're at a fancy restaurant and somebody serves you know a sizzling hot full we'll just stay on filet for a while right they serve a hot sizzling filet at the table next to you yeah you're gonna look over your shoulder and go fuck yeah that looks good but you're not gonna get out of your chair and walk over there and take it off the table (laughs) right like you're gonna appreciate it and you're gonna just go back to being you yeah but if somebody takes that same filet and serves it to you know your wife or your girlfriend or Mm -hmm. whoever's sitting next to you dude you might be tempted to like take a fork and like Right. You know, take a little piece of it yeah. off the plate. Yeah. Right. Because you're reacting to something that's in the right lane for mm-hmm. you. Like the angle for you to react to that and put it in your mouth yeah, is yeah. correct. Yes. I think the same thing is happening with mm-hmm. fish. I think right? so too. You, that angle makes or breaks yeah. that fish choosing to react We're not. or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even with just. How I look, how I think about how bass will position themselves to eat whatever it is, shad or trout, when they're sitting like behind that rock, 
and they're just waiting for stuff to go by, if that fish comes 10 feet off, the bass isn't going to go chase out there. He's in the ambush. He mm-hmm. wants one that's much closer to mm-hmm. him. So if your lure is running 10 feet off, that fish is watching it go by. I'm like, next one that comes by, dude, I'm going to fucking crush it as long as it comes closer to me. Because mm. I'm not going to go out there in open water and chase this thing down. Right. That's just going to – I probably will lose, right, because I'm sitting here for a reason. Mm-hmm. But if you pick that lane and know, like, i got to get close to that rock or that tree or that dock because that fish is sitting there, if I can get it as close to him as possible, it's going to be so much harder for him to say no. Because this is how he naturally feeds. And there could be that reaction thing where he's behind that rock. He can't see anything coming. But as soon as that thing goes by him, boom. And then he realized, like, ah, fuck, that was fake. Right? And so that's, like, one of the big things is that you're hoping for is that you get the right angle. The fish doesn't know it's coming. But as soon as your bait crosses that threshold and it sees it, it just eats it. Yeah. And I feel like that's a great way, especially with, like, a crankbait. If it's sitting, you know, behind a tree or a log or a rock or something like that, it's going, it hears it coming, it's like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, yeah. And then it finally shows up, it just eats it out of reaction. I also think, I also think that bass play a risk versus reward scenario in their heads. Absolutely. A lot. 100%. So I liken it, the closest thing I can think of in my head to what I think fish are going through is like gambling Mm. or like poker, Mm. right? So... I think a fish is constantly looking at food and thinking risk first reward. Yeah. If I go chase this fucking thing down, Mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot out of me to get it. But if I get it, Mm -hmm. that's going to be food for days. That's, that's a major fuel. Mm -hmm. So the payoff is probably worth it here. Yeah. Versus, you know, like you, the scenario that you gave, like mm-hmm. if, if it's 10 feet off the rock and it's swimming around out there in the middle of nowhere and they're looking like risk first reward, mm-hmm. like, yeah, if I actually catch that thing, it might be worth it. But fuck, I, the likelihood of me catching it is probably like 5%. Right. So it's not worth the risk first reward. Mm-hmm. If your angle is right and the fish are up, the fish are in their feeding yep. lane, their mm-hmm. kitchen, right? your angle is right and you've presented the bait, this risk first reward thing happens, I believe, in Mm. these fish's minds Mm -hmm. where they may even know it's bullshit. Mm. They may even, or have some kind of like little tingly, spidey sense. Like, like, I ah. don't, that's not what I'm used to seeing. (laughs) Yeah. But it's fuck, right it's there. big, and it's it's coming right in my lane. Yeah. Literally, all I have to do is open my mouth, <laughs> yeah. right? And so I think some of this comes into play. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't know how else to explain c- ever catching a fish, honestly, <laughs> yeah. because, you know, it's not like we fish in places where there's literally no food, and they're like, oh, finally, a yeah. bait. I yeah. can eat something. Like, you know, everywhere we fish has obviously plenty of food yeah that's why there's big fish right right? so you know i i think it's just kind of like us at a at a at a poker game where like if you're playing blackjack and Mm -hmm. you get some shitty fucking cards and you get like 17 and you know you're gonna (laughs) lose you know the dealer is gonna beat you (laughs) and you know you shouldn't ask for another card yeah. because the likelihood of you busting is is so oh, yeah. high right but sometimes dude you just you you throw caution to the wind you say fuck it hit me yeah and i think the fish do the same thing mm-hmm. and you know it takes a little bit of of luck on our side absolutely but you're going to get more luck the more often you're making casts mm-hmm. If you fish once Making a month right and you make, you know, uh, a thousand casts in a day, you might only get one or two like punch cards on your luck right. ticket. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you go three days a week, four days a week, you're getting punch tickets every fucking time you're out there. Sooner yeah. or later, your punch cards full. Full. Right. Like, and you get a free bath. <laughs> exactly. Right. So you're just gonna you're going to get more opportunity to have those little moments mm-hmm. where something goes in your favor. Right. They forget. They say, fuck it, the risk is worth the reward. Yeah. They yeah. reacted. Like, 
you know, I, and but that's getting back to what you said originally is the only way you're ever going to really do it is you've just got to put the time in. Or yeah. you just got to be the luckiest motherfucker on the face of the planet, <laughs> that. which has never been me. Never me. So I'm no. never planning on that <laughs> happening. So we're back to just grinding it and yeah. and hoping that through the time we're just getting enough like little lucky punch right. tickets. Eventually you know you I mean? cash it in for a fish. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and hopefully it's 20 plus pounds. That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a topic that we could talk on. I mean, honestly, dude, probably for hours, right? 100%. And I, I think we've really just kind of scratched the surface right. on this. Yeah. But I think now that we've kind of really started verbalizing it, mm. I think there's multiple topics within the conversation we've had today oh, yeah. that could literally be other conversations. Oh, yeah. And we should bring some of our friends on, too, mm. to talk about it mm -hmm. and and share experiences, oh, yeah. right? But I think at the end of the day, I think understanding that big fish just have a different... They're, they're just a different behavior, a mm -hmm. different mindset. Like everything about them just changes. is unique, yes, right? Very. Uh, it's kind of like when you're dating, like it's pretty easy to just like bag a bunch of fives and sixes. But if, you know, you want to go smash a 10, like <laughs> gotta put dude, in you got to up your game. Like you've got to, you know, you got to dress right. <laughs> right. You know, you got to, your hygiene's got to be on point. You have to go to the gym every once in yeah. a while. Like it's not, you can't just sh like, schmuck into no. a bar and go Doesn't pull a 10 like right so it's kind of the same way in bass fishing mm -hmm. like if you if you're going to be serious about this you really got to put the work in oh, yeah. pay attention to all those little details and and be sharp yeah when you can be sharp mm -hmm. and it's going to be it's going to be a fun topic to always revisit with you oh yeah it's going to be really fun for me and I think everybody that attaches to you to watch your journey, you know, whether it's whether it's here in Arizona, yeah. whether it's, you know, through your travels, whether it's when you move to Japan and you chase it. It's going to be exciting to kind of live through you mm. and see how this whole thing unfolds and pans out. And dude, I just I can't wait to see you holding this mug. Like, you guys are going to have to fly out. Oh, Dude, just keep Same it in the live well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there in 22 hours. <laughs> she juice. Put some ice on it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Hopefully, uh, I don't fail everybody or even just fail myself. But I just I have this very strong, like, urge to do it. And it really only came maybe within the last... Is it a decade or so that I've really wanted to chase the world record just because I'm in the position to be able to do it. Uh, and I think it can be done. Hmm. So we'll, we'll have to see, right? Something that I took away from the first podcast episode that mm -hmm. we did is you had a line in there that, you know, when you fail, you're learning. Mm -hmm. It's only failure when you give up. Yeah. Right. And that was a pretty impactful <laughs> line. And and I know there's no quit in you. So yeah. it may not be the easiest road. It might be a long grind. It might mm -hmm. be a long haul. Yeah. But enjoying the journey and the amount of learning that you're you're having through this process right. of chasing these big fish is 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 just really cool. Mm -hmm. It's really fun to to tap in and shoot the shit about yeah. it and you know see how things are going and it, it'll be fun to keep sharing whatever new things yeah we learn or you learn really i just like catching little ones now. i know you do yeah <laughs> so but dude i appreciate you taking the time yeah. it's always always fun to talk and uh you know let's let's do it again let's expand on some of these topics oh yeah on some of these future episodes because they can go so much especially deeper. that color topic color That's an important is one. huge <laughs> <laughs> well cheers my All friend right. Cheers, All everyone. right, peace out, my guys. See you later. Later.